Uh, my plan today is to uh, really present um, simply an overview of the, the range of uh, research activities that go on in my lab. We're, as you know, we're just a few miles up the road from, from you and uh, we are um, always looking for opportunities to collaborate and, and in fact, uh, there are folks on this call who, who have, have or, or are currently collaborating with our lab. So, so thank you for that and, and I hope there, there can be more of that. Um, so I'll, I'll get right, right to it. Uh, just wanna share our, our mission statement um, with you. Um, so uh, I know you can read, but I'll, I'll say it out loud. So the mission of the Hydrology and Remote Sensing Lab is to conduct nationally oriented basic and applied research on water resources and remote sensing concerns related to the production of food and fiber and the conservation of natural resources. So this is, this is our mission statement. And uh, I'd like to draw an analogy um, as, as Adele uh, said, uh, uh, I did my PhD uh, in, in Boston and there's this spot, it was probably half a mile from the last place I lived in Boston, uh, I lived in Cambridge, half a mile from where I lived in Cambridge and, and also just, um, just to, the, um, to the west of the MIT campus, there's this interesting spot uh, and I, I, I read this somewhere, I forget where, but there's this interesting spot um, in, uh, in Cambridge where the Charles River flows under a uh, train, uh, a bridge for a train, and then the BU bridge is uh, immediately on top of that. And there was um, at least one time I remember leaving uh, Logan Airport in an airplane and flying roughly um, over the aerial spot that you see here. And so it's, it's an interesting spot in that um, if you timed it all correctly, it would be possible for there to be uh, a boat on the river with a train going over top of that, with a car on the BU bridge going over top of that, and then finally uh, a bunch of folks up in an airplane. So um, in, in an XY sense, uh, four different layers of, of transport. And so um, I'd like to uh, continue with that layer analogy uh, and, and present the hydrology and remote sensing lab to you as, as a, um, a group of, of scientists that are looking at, um, at water and, and using remote sensing tools um, from multiple elevations across the, um, uh, over the landscape. Um, we, we're, we're out there uh, in space, uh, much of, uh, Many of the scientists in my lab do satellite work. Um, we uh, have uh, folks who do UAV work for um, much closer to the Earth's surface. Then um, just above the Earth's surface, we have a number of people work um, in uh, interpreting uh, information from flux towers. And then actually at the Earth's surface, a uh, number of people who do on the ground very uh, traditional monitoring of, of hydrology and then even below the ground. So um, if there are four places uh, you can be at the same time in Boston, uh, we're at five different layers uh, looking at, at hydrology, our lab is. So let me kind of um, just give a, an overview of uh, who the folks are that uh, relate to each of these layers. So I, I mentioned I'll start at the highest elevation first, so uh, satellite work. Um, so obviously from satellites, uh, you, can, uh, you can tell an amazing amount of information, much more than I realized before I joined this lab, but um, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, vegetative stress, and, 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 and more. And the, uh, the, the dominant um, researchers in, in this area uh, are Martha Anderson, Mike Kosh, Wade Crow, Feng Gao, and Bill Kustis. And, um, and by the way, I, I, I don't know if the word has reached you. For those of you who know Bill Kustis, he was, it was just announced um, 
this week uh, that uh, Bill is being inducted into the ARS Hall of Fame. So this is uh, really a career acknowledgement um, that, uh, that uh, folks, uh, only the, 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 you know, the, the, the very cream of the uh, cream of researchers in, in ARS uh, ever, ever make it to the Hall of Fame. If you go to the, the nice new building uh, on Sunnyside, uh, there's actually a wall where there's a plaque for every ARS Hall of Famer. And um, uh, I'm saying this from memory, there may be 40, 40 or so plaques up there um, for careers that you know, span uh, back into the uh, early, um, early 20th century to the present. Um, to give you one sense of uh, a little bit of the, the work that we're doing, I'm gonna show you work that is uh, primarily uh, that of Feng Gao and, and, and Martha Anderson, um, the, uh, the, the notion of data fusion. So let me go to the um, next slide. And so, um, oh, I got a space, uh, missing a space there. So um, Feng Gao, especially in my lab, has pioneered the, the notion of data fusion uh, to develop high resolution data sets. So you've, the, the, the main idea is that you have, um, you have uh, a snapshot um, from, from space, from one platform um, that perhaps is high resolution, but infrequent returns. Um, and then um, you, uh, you can um, uh, zoom in on a particular point of interest. And so obviously here we're um, uh, looking at the Eastern shore of, of Maryland. And um, uh, what Feng does is he takes the, the high resolution and it actually he uses different even higher resolution satellites that I'm suggesting here. But um, uh, for instance, he, the, the Landsat uh, gives you very high resolution, um, but you get a return roughly every two weeks. Um, whereas uh, the GOES information uh, is, is near daily, but much coarser resolution. And so Feng has, has pioneered these methods to um, merge these two data sets to, to, in essence, have the best of both worlds. You have the, the high resolution, high spatial resolution of the Landsat and the high temporal resolution uh, of the GOES information. Um, lots of cool stuff you can, you can look at from space, and this is just more of a gee whiz slide than anything else. Uh, there, there certainly are folks in my lab who work with GRACE, um, the GRACE mission, um, but uh, it, it's really remarkable that um, one can study just simply the variations in, in, um, in uh, Earth's gravity and from that uh, infer uh, water storage or, or, the, or, or differences in the water, water storage over time. And so this is done, for instance, to, to uh, understand what's going on with um, storage in aquifers or perhaps um, uh, understanding more about uh, snowpack. Okay, so coming from uh, outer space and entering the Earth's atmosphere, uh, uh, you have um, UAVs or UAS uh, or, or layman's terms, drones. Uh, that can look down on the, uh, the landscape from a, a very low elevation and have extremely high resolution, um, can also avoid things like uh, uh, problems with cloud cover. And um, in, addition, uh, in addition to that, obviously you can, by flying your own drone, you can, you can order up your own data set without having to uh, negotiate anything uh, with uh, uh, dealing with uh, satellite providers of data. You're, you're, you're generating your own data as you need it. Um, would like to say that uh, uh, we used to have, uh, until the end of this year, um, uh, Ray Hunt and Craig Daughtry, who were um, both uh, excellent um, researchers that both employed um, UAVs in their work. Uh, they have both retired, effective the end of 
uh, the calendar, uh, the end of calendar 2020. And so uh, taking up the charge of this work is uh, Michael Kosh. Um, and we actually have a search that's just about to be advertised. I'm waiting for the HR person to get back to me. So we will be actually searching uh, in a position where we're hoping that um, one form of expertise, the, the scientists we identify, will come to us with, um, with UAV expertise. So uh, a little lean right now in, in UAV expertise, but, but, but hoping to grow. Um, the actual image that you see in front of you is, is of the BARC campus. The, the yellow outline is, is, is BARC, Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, as, as Adele said. And uh, it may be hard to see, but you can see that red line there. Um, that, that red line, and, and actually in the inset, it's, it's easy to see. That red line is, is basically the, the no-fly zone um, around um, the nation's capital. And uh, as it turns out, uh, most of BARC is, is unfortunately just within that red line. Um, but there is the airfield. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm, I'm circling the, the airfield on the screen. And um, that is outside of um, the no-fly zone. And so that's where if we're doing work of our own. Um, possibly development work, we're, we're out there. And I'll have some more to say about that, that, that area late in, in, in my talk, but this is our UAV work. Okay, getting uh, at least connected to the ground, but still somewhat up in the air uh, is our flux tower work. And so um, uh, the, the two scientists in my lab who work the most with uh, flux tower work are Joe Alfieri and, and Bill Kustis. And um, so you're, 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 you're dealing with um, eddy covariant structures and, and you can say with um, very, very high temporal resolution what's going on in a three-dimensional sense uh, in the neighborhood of your, of your flux tower. Uh, and uh, pictured here, obviously in the center is the flux tower. You can see in the lower right, um, the, uh, the sort of claw-like area is where the, the sensors are focusing um, their uh, understanding of what's going on with the, the three-dimensional movement of, of the air and moisture in the air. And uh, at the far, uh, in the lower left, um, you can see a picture taken, I believe, from on top of a flux tower. This is out in California. Um, Bill and Joe and, and others work um, extensively in, in vineyards. Uh, and we have a longstanding agreement um, with the uh, Gallo wineries, um, helping them develop um, really innovative irrigation techniques. And if you, if you think about a vineyard, it's a very complicated um, space to work in because you, you basically, you don't have a single texture like say a, 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 a row crops of soybean or corn, but instead you've got the, the vines and then you have sort of in a, in a sense, a cover crop that exists on the ground between the vines. So you really have um, two different uh, kinds of vegetation present. Um, and the challenge in vineyards is, is, is really a, a tricky one because um, uh, you want to um, apply enough water to, um, to have a, a, a strong yield, but you don't want so much water that you uh, damage the vintage. And I'm, 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 I'm horribly oversimplifying um, the, the, uh, the thinking. Uh, the other thing is, of course, you're in California where, where water is very precious. So being able to apply uh, just the right amount of water is important for for yield, for quality of the of the crop, and also just simply as a as a resource. So, um, lots of really interesting questions uh, to pursue there. Okay, finally reaching the ground, um, we're at the the surface level, and so I'm I'm just simply picturing a stream gauging um, house uh, on the banks of a uh, stream. You can see a. Uh, Glenn, we, we don't, we are not hearing you. Sounds like we froze up. Uh-oh. 
what could be the cause? Um, it's, I'm guessing it's on his end since uh, we're still both doing okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe he uh, can log out and log back in. Um, if he needs to do that. Let me see if uh, I think, uh, let's see here. Okay, so he's logged out, so he'll probably log right back in here in a second. Okay. It's okay. Uh, I will, I think I need to have um, co-host again. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry about the disruption. Okay. Glenn, mm -hmm. one, more, one more thing that uh, Marty and I forgot to mention that we usually record these seminars. Is that okay with you? Yeah, I saw the recording sign. Yeah. That, that's perfectly fine. Okay, okay. I, I apologize. I forgot to ask you at the beginning. Okay. Uh, not at all. So I, I believe I was on this slide when I, I actually heard you say you couldn't hear me. Um, yes. But uh, okay, so I, I, I think I was here. So um, now I'm all <laughs> now I'm all flustered. Uh, so here we are. Uh, we're on the ground. And, um, and you can see, uh, for instance, a gauging station shown here. Uh, the scientists who, who work uh, primarily with these kinds of data are uh, Kathleen Hateman, Greg McCarty, uh, myself, and um, we actually, uh, we have a new scientist, uh, Susong Zhang, who will be starting with us uh, in, in mid-April. Um, and a uh, little picture shown here um, below, uh, some interesting work being done. This is, this is primarily uh, Kathleen and Greg's work, um, taking advantage of a change in the um, left and right handedness of, um, of, a, of a herbicide, metolachlor. Uh, it has a metabolite called um, MISA. Don't ask me to tell you the full name of the, the metabolite. Um, but if you measure the fraction of left and right handedness of MISA, you can actually date the water that you're dealing with. Um, because in uh, year 2000, the fraction of makeup of left and right handedness of MISA shifted from 50 50, I believe, to 90 10. Uh, and I can never remember which, it, which, um, which is the 90 and which is the 10 as far as the left and right handedness. But, um, this uh, this is not unlike the um, the uh, measuring uh, various uh, uh, radioactive isotopes in the in the atmosphere as a way of dating um, dating things. Uh, this is uh, sort of a natural experiment that was set up um, quite by accident by the agricultural community. And so Greg and, and Kathleen are are leading. Uh, an effort that they call um, watershed lag time. And again, you're using um, clever use of environmental tracers. I, I spoke about MISA, something that's um, much more still on the drawing board is looking at sucralose. Uh, as you know, sucralose is, 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 is basically the, uh, the Splenda that you put in your, your drink if you don't want any calories. And the reason it doesn't impart any calories to you is, it's because the body doesn't know how to digest it, uh, which also means that, uh, um, not to go too, too into detail about this, basically wastewater treatment plants uh, that receive uh, sucralose basically pass it on through as well. And so you can look at um, background sucralose um, concentrations and perhaps make estimates of um, of a fraction of urban land uh, upstream of a, of a particular point by, by looking at concentrations of sucralose. So we're looking at sort of these naturally occurring uh, for other reasons, um, I shouldn't say naturally occurring, human uh, occurrences for, for um, experiments that really weren't planned, both the MISA and the sucralose, as clever environmental tracers to, to better understand um, the timing and fraction of land um, and land uses upstream. And so this is work. Uh, the chop tank is, is what's shown here on the Eastern shore, but this is actually a, a national level 
uh, effort, and I'll have a little more to say on that in a little bit. Um, uh, showing you uh, sort of what's behind the hood here, um, so some, uh, some of our monitoring stations on, in the chop tank on the Eastern shore um, so that we can measure um, both uh, quantity and, and especially quality in, in near real time. And you can see, um, on, especially in the left-hand graph here, you have some sense of the temporal density of the, the information that is uh, that these, uh, these monitoring stations are able to, uh, to collect. Would like to finally go now uh, below the land surface, uh, looking at um, shallow and, and, and when I say deep groundwater, I'm, I basically mean that you're in a, in a confined aquifer setting. And uh, again, it's the same, um, the same people, Kathleen Haitman, Greg McCarty, myself, and Susang Zhang. And um, we've been doing a lot of work looking at wetlands uh, on the Eastern shore, both uh, natural and restored wetlands, and looking at um, uh, basically putting um, uh, 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 pressure transducers or other ways of measuring the um, water table both at depth and, and at, in the near surface. And so you end up with uh, some situations where you have a um, shown in the, in the inset, a perched aquifer, and you can see um, really interesting uh, movements of water both, um, both up and down uh, within, uh, within a location, giving you some sense of the, the, the dynamics of, of water movement in, in the vertical and, and, and somewhat in the horizontal uh, in these um, natural and, and restored wetlands. I'd like to um, speak briefly. Um, I have a few slides here about LTAR. So LTAR is a national level network of, um, of sites that uh, are run primarily by ARS, but there are a few universities that run them as well. So LTAR, long-term agro ecosystem research. So this is sort of a complement to the NSF LTER program, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, um, so my lab, along with uh, a couple other labs at BARC, are, um, are collectively the Lower Chesapeake Bay node of LTAR. Um, and our sites are um, both on the BARC campus and um, on the eastern shore of Maryland in the Chop Tank uh, watershed. To give you a sense of the, the breadth of the LTAR network, um, this was the, the start date is sort of up for uh, interpretation, but um, uh, the idea was uh, first uh, floated very seriously in 2012. Uh, and the idea was to collect data for a, a considerable length of time. And so uh, you can see a number of locations there on the map uh, where, where we are. Uh, there's a California site, uh, which is uh, conspicuously missing in the map, but um, that is gonna come online in the next year or so. Uh, and again, we are primarily ARS laboratories, uh, but it also includes um, uh, University of Florida, Michigan State, and University of Nebraska helping run uh, three of our locations. Uh, and again, here's a, here's a slightly easier to look at map, and I've circled the lower Chesapeake Bay uh, area as if you don't know where the Chesapeake Bay is, um, but this is, this is our particular node within uh, this overall network. And so, you know, what, what is LTAR about? Um, the, the idea of LTAR is that it um, is removing uh, intellectual silos. And I, I, I have to say that I have come to know people um, across all of ARS um, by virtue of my work with LTAR. Um, and uh, certainly LTAR is something that we're hoping our university uh, collaborators are, are, is something that we um, would like to invite folks to, to join with us. Um, Idea is to is to look at um, uh, obviously enhancing productivity, protecting the environment, and also protecting uh, rural 
prosperity. And so the argument is that at the center of a Venn diagram that's looking at all three of those things is, is sustainability. And so LTAR is about the sustainable intensification of, of US agriculture. That's, that's its primary goal. And um, how does it work? We have um, across the country, we have um, a coordinated set of what we call common experiments, the, the common experiment where we look at business as usual practices and we look also at aspirational practices and try to compare um, the trade-offs that we see coming out of those. And, and, and it's, it's a moving target, it's an evolving world. And so what's, what's um, aspirational now may become business as usual within say the next 10 years or so. Um, and so the, what's aspirational is, is, is always the goalpost is always moving uh, so that we can continue to try to seek uh, better environmental protection, better productivity, and, and stronger rural prosperity. Here at BARC, uh, we have a, a field we refer to as OP3. Uh, I don't know that uh, the, the branding people at, say, Colgate would have come up with this, but um, this was named by my uh, research leader a couple of um, generations before me, Walter Rawls. Uh, OB3 stands for optimizing production for the inputs. Uh, I'm sorry, optimizing production inputs for, optim for optimizing economic and environmental enhancement. So the, the, the exponent three is for the three E's that you see there. Um, and so this was LTAR thinking before LTAR existed. And I, I provide the link here where you could learn some more about it, or you can just simply use a, do a Google search on OP3 USDA and you would, you would find it as well. And so what is OP3? This is on the BART campus. It's, it's a relatively small set of, well, it's a single 22 acre, uh, sorry, 22 hectare field, which has been divided into several subfields and, and has been the source of um, really intensive um, investigation uh, for long uh, before I, I arrived um, in the lab. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, the kinds of experiments that are going on have, have focused on um, the diminished, um, diminished use of, uh, of fertilizer and seeing how yield responds to that so that uh, you, can, you can find that sweet spot in the trade-offs between yield and say water quality from, from fertilizer application. And uh, this last bullet, uh, save from the MagLab project, I don't know how aware you are of this. I know Adele is aware of this project. Um, others may, may be less so. Um, but there is something called the uh, a superconducting maglev project, which is really a demonstration project for a uh, basically um, a, a levitation train, high-speed levitation train uh, that will use uh, 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 these magnets in the train to travel, basically uh, float above a kind of a trough, which is, um, at least in the Baltimore, Washington area basically um, is going along the right of way at the Baltimore, Washington uh, Parkway. And I've zoomed in here and I'm showing the airstrip option. This, this hasn't happened yet. It hasn't been constructed yet. Um, but if you can see my, my screen, uh, my cursor, OP3 is right here and it's being sandwiched by, there's basically a, a rail yard that's being planned uh, that's going to destroy um, certainly uh, uh, long-term, uh, some long-term collections because of uh, changes to prevailing winds and, and, and so forth, because this is, this whole thing is an, is an elevated uh, construction above the, above the landscape. And so we've, um, we've come up with these buttons and uh, if you, if you come visit me, I'll share a button with you, but um, uh, this is somewhat tongue in cheek, but we're um, for those of you that are really young, there was a show, the Andy Griffiths show, and uh, Andy Griffiths' son was uh, Opie Taylor. Opie uh, is Ron Howard, who you may, those of you who are older, I'm sorry, those of you who are younger know Ron Howard maybe as a um, 
a film film director, not as an actor, but he was a little kid on the Andy Griffith show. And so we, this is a picture of him there. And so uh, we've uh, got a campaign to save Opie. And uh, with that, uh, I leave you with a picture of, of our lab. This is a couple of years ago. We, we've obviously been in telework pandemic uh, lockdown for uh, the past year, um, but this is back when we were didn't have to worry about social distancing. And those of you who, who know some of us uh, may recognize some familiar faces there. So with that, uh, um, not too bad. I leave you with uh, some time for questions if anybody has questions. And uh, my, my apologies for the, um, the AV difficulties there in the middle. Yeah, no problem. Thanks very much, uh, Glenn. I appreciate that. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can write them into the chat box and we'll pass them along here. Um, and I, but I'll venture one myself and I, I know you didn't identify yourself as sort of leading, you know, working primarily in this business with the, uh, the flux towers. But um, I've, I've always sort of struggled to get my head around sort of the nature of sort of the spatial versus the temporal variability uh, in these kinds of measurements that are coming out of this flux tower and it's you know it strikes me as this you know a point in space but it's obviously doing something about integrating some sort of spatial component to this and you know at this high level time resolution and i'm wondering if you could if you knew, if you knew enough to kind of you know help me to get my head around that a little bit better well actually you you've said it very well and i'm not sure that i can uh, do much to uh to uh to to do that question justice, but uh, you're right. The um, the actual sensor is obviously this uh, this claw like thing that's that's very much measuring what's going on at a point. Um, from looking at uh, some of the papers, uh, especially I'm thinking of Joe's papers right now, Joe Alfieri. Um, there's a lot of um, work that's done to imagine. Um, multiple scales of of of, um, of 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 eddies, and so I think that uh, you get there by assumptions, uh, and I don't know how strong those assumptions are, but I think I think it, the the flux tower can say a lot about what's going on in the field in which it resides. Uh, I don't know. Obviously, uh, the further you get from it, the obviously the less representative it is. Um, so I'm I'm I'm. I'm sorry. I'm I'm really not going to be able to say much okay, about well, versus an area. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, but it, it, they, they, there are there are assumptions made about scales of, of different eddies uh, movements, uh, and so I think uh, they 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 can generalize at least to the field. Beyond that, I, I'm not so sure. Okay. Uh, there was a question that came in that was wondering since you're sitting right on this no fly zone. How do the folks doing the, uh, you know, the drones, the UAVs? How, how do they sort of manage to? Do they they can't cross the line with the drones? They've got to stay kind of outside the boundary. If they ever go over, they program that in. How do they manage all that? Right. Well, you do. You do. Um, uh, the software that I've seen, you actually program a flight plan, so you can you can absolutely control a flight plan that uh, isn't going to cross the boundary. Um, most of the work that uh, I've seen done at the airstrip is is mostly um, making sure the equipment is working right, um, and then doing some um, small scale efforts uh, where they uh, they'll time a satellite overpass with uh, the UAV mm. being there at the field where pretty much the dominant um, uh, vegetation is just uh, scrub; it's not even uh, farmed. Um, uh, but you're you're correlating what the UAV sees with what the, with what the satellite sees. The the UAV is 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 used much more um, extensively, uh, say at our locations, say on the eastern shore, or we'll we'll box it up and take it um, to I don't know Iowa or Oklahoma or wherever mm -hmm. where folks go. Um, in the time that since I've joined ARS, it was just last spring that we finally were able to um, 
petition FAA for a waiver. And so on a very limited basis um, and you know, filling out a lot of paperwork, we have been given permission to fly within the no-fly zone. And that's something that's new just in the last, uh, I guess it was about June, if I recall last mm -hmm. year, that we finally flew within the no-fly zone for the first time since it was established. So I'm hoping that um, that conditions will relax a little bit more and we'll, we'll be allowed to do that um, more frequently. Right, good. Uh, okay. Well, I don't uh, see any other questions rolling in right here. So I have you, I have a question. Go ahead, Adele. Uh, Glenn, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, collaborations with other universities, with many of the projects, of course, and and uh, I mean several of our faculty. I'm sure whether with your lab or some of the other Bark labs, they have collaborations. I definitely benefited uh, over the years. Uh, from hydrology remote sensing lab and some of the other labs as well in different research programs. But um, what are the also opportunities? I mean, uh, their students, as, as you know, we have a student of faculty, uh, students come to faculty, ask for jobs and summer jobs, Tim for these and all that. Would you like to comment some about those as well, please? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I think especially there are, are, are summer opportunities, uh, internship uh, opportunities that uh, in my experience, the, the real trick is, is simply just agreeing um, on an activity and, and having, um, having some plan for what's gonna happen uh, with, uh, with the summer. We have plenty of room to, to house folks. Um, it's, uh, it's a little weird right now during the pandemic, but, um, uh, the uh, there there are lots of opportunities to um, to uh, pursue internships for for students. Uh, we typically have um, anywhere from uh, five to ten um, students uh, at the anything from the high school through um, graduate level, and then and then there are postdocs who come not for a summer but usually for a few years. Um, so I, I think the trick here is to um, is to identify an activity and, and approach the, the right um, the right uh, lab member and um, do it right about now or maybe a little earlier than now so that uh, paperwork can be submitted uh, to, to to provide the access that's needed and, and to even petition for some modest funding. Um, uh, there are more more, um, you know, much um, more serious activities that can be pursued through, um, say, NEFA grants or, or, or other um, uh, USDA grant mechanisms. Um, that takes obviously much more planning than, and then ultimately success of the, uh, of the proposal, but, but that goes on as well. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you're aware we had talked that before uh, for the benefit of other audience, we have more than 50 some actually cooperative agreements with BARC uh, through our college from through different labs. And I really encourage uh, those of you who feel like in some of these research areas, uh, let's communicate with Glenn and, you know, he can link with appropriate scientists and we can see if we can develop both externally external proposals to get funding, but also sometimes uh, can be cooperative agreement that may be to fund a graduate student or something. So it's a, it's a, a great avenue to really uh, fund some of the graduate students or even undergraduates to work on joint projects with, yeah. Great. I would, I would also, I mean, I, I think it goes without saying, but I'll, I'll, I will explicitly say it. I mean, our lab is, is one of several that I think have natural linkages to activities that are likely going on in your lab. Um, there's a sustainable ag systems lab, uh, adaptive cropping systems lab, which does a lot of uh, climate oriented research. But there are a number of labs um, that have primarily either a natural resources or, or cropping systems orientation that I think would have um, natural linkages to, to stuff that goes on, to research that's going on in, in your department. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've been working with Greg McCarty for probably close to a decade at this point. So. 
and it's been a great relationship. Yeah, Top Top Tank Watershed has been there for years. I mean, through SEEP project, I I collaborated with uh, with the colleagues uh, Greg Ali Sadegi, who retired, and so on and so forth. Yeah, it has been it has been really very productive collaboration between our faculty and ARC, and especially hydrology remote sensing lab. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, thank you again, Glenn, for uh, taking time to come be with us today and to give us a, an overview of what's going on in your lab. And we look forward to uh, ongoing good cooperative interactions with all you guys out there. Thank you very much for the invitation. I, I've Give our greetings to your folks. <laughs> Will do. Uh, I, I hope I can see all of you in person sometime before too long. Very good. Glenn, thank you so much. We'll talk later. Take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Yeah.